Hi, I'm Dr. Jeffrey Zeig, and I'm the director of the Milton Erickson Foundation in Phoenix, Arizona. I want to take this opportunity to provide a little background about the person who Milton Erickson was. Certainly, there's a lot written about Erickson. There's probably 100 books now that are about Erickson directly, um, that describe his contributions using various lenses that are on the floor of the philosophical universe. So a lot can be said about who Erickson was as a professional, and certainly by most psychotherapists, he's acknowledged as a genius, as one of the people who contributed uh, massively to the lore of psychotherapy, to the technique of psychotherapy, to the practice of psychotherapy. I first met Milton Erickson to talk about who he was as a, a person. So I first met Milton Erickson in 1973. I had my master's degree. I was a licensed therapist. I was a marriage family counselor in California. And I started studying about hypnosis. And when I started studying about hypnosis, I was fascinated and I asked, what should I read? My supervisor said, well, read this book, Advanced Techniques of Hypnosis and Therapy. It's a book that's no longer in print, but it was the only book that was available about Erickson because Erickson mostly wrote articles and he didn't write books. There were other people who took his work and turned those uh, articles and thoughts and contributions into books. And I read this book and I was stunned. So I wrote a frivolous postcard to my cousin who was studying nursing in Tucson. I said, Ellen, if you ever go to Phoenix, you have to visit Milton Erickson. This man's a genius. And Ellen wrote me back and she said, Jeff, don't you remember my old roommate, Roxana Erickson? And Ellen and Roxana had spent time together in Mexico, part of their undergraduate education. I had met Ellen and Roxana in 1970 and I couldn't have possibly remembered her last name, but I remembered meeting her, and so I wrote to Dr. Erickson, I wrote to Roxana, I sent a copy of an article that I had written, which was a utilization technique, a technique based in Erickson's work about working with auditory hallucinations of schizophrenic patients. It was the first article that I published, the second article actually, that I published professionally. and. Erickson uh, wrote back and uh, asked him if I could be his student, and Erickson wrote back and said no. And he said in this personalized letter, he said that his health was rocky and that he um, really couldn't take any students, and certainly the patients that he was seeing couldn't be used for my education. But he wrote at the, bit, at the end of that letter, when you read my work, don't you don't need to pay attention to the patter, to the techniques, to the wordings of suggestions. The really important thing is motivation for change and the fact that no human being ever fully knows his own capabilities. Now I was stunned that this genius would write back this personalized letter to an admiring student, so I must have written back and said, okay, I don't need to be your student, can I please visit you? And he wrote back, yes. And so in December of 1973, or November of 1973, I uh, made a trek to Phoenix. And I encountered Erickson. He was a very infirmed, frail man. And this, he was 72. He turned 73 while I was there. And he was wearing total purple because he was colorblind, and so his family made these purple leisure suits so that they could more easily dress him. He suffered the residuals of polio. And to say that he was quadriplegic would be an exaggeration, but not so much, because he really couldn't use his legs, and his arms were very weak. He could, sometimes to write, he would have to guide his right hand with his left hand, because his left hand was stronger than his right. And his vision was double, his hearing was impaired, he was breathing by virtue of a few intercostal muscles and half a diaphragm, so each breath was labored. And um, constant chronic pain. His vision was double, his hearing was impaired, and yet he transcended that pain, got outside of himself, and started to talk with me about, not teaching me about psychotherapy, but teaching me about how to enjoy life, how to be a better person. And it was so stunning. If you went to Erickson and you were suffering from pain or you were suffering from uh, limitations, you were talking to a man who had more pain, more limitations than you had, and he was just laughing all the time. And so he was so inspiring. And I remember the second day that I was there and I saw him painfully 
just push himself, he could barely do this, he could just push himself off of his wheelchair into his office chair. He flopped into his office chair and then started to talk with me about how to be a better therapist, how to be a better person. And I was just so moved. There were tears streaming down my face. I said, you know, Dr. Erickson, you're the most impressive human being I have ever met in my life. And I was so completely congruent and very quickly, uh, seamlessly, he looked up at me and he said, you know, Jeff, I'm just another old bozo along the path of life. Because he didn't want to be on a pedestal, even one that was made of pure marble. So lots of times when people read about Erickson, it seems that he is this uh, technician and that he is so um, thoughtful about all of the things that he was doing. And certainly he was. He was a genius about what he did. But more impressive was the genius of how he lived and how he presented this image of being the wounded healer, the person who is deeply wounded but transcends those wounds to be able to help others. And I want to be sure that that aspect of the humanity of who Erickson was is adequately presented, not just the technical genius. Thank you.